In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Joyous feast. Joyous feast. I was out hiking yesterday, a little ways from our house, further down 89, going south. And it was quite a quite a climb. There's a trail, I think it's called the Copper Mine Trail or something like that. But it goes way up. It's a really steep climb. But you can see uh, you could see all of this weather rolling in. All of the, the clouds kind of heavy <laughs> to the point where they start to look black at the bottom, you know, so you know something's gonna come back. And um, so it's a very beautiful thing to see. Today's gospel passage, we hear of this blind man who's a beggar. And um, uh, I knew I wanted to share with you something. Many of you know that I used to work in a psychiatric hospital years ago in Boston. At one time, there was a man there at the hospital, who was an elderly, older Greek man, and had been raised in the church. He had a lot, he was suffering a lot. Um, and he found out that I was a deacon, at the time I was a deacon in the church, the Athenos. And I remember him telling me, he said, you know what that means in contemporary Greece today? what the word diakonos means. He said it actually means a beggar. Because in the church, he said, the deacon is always saying, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. That's, those are all the parts that, I do them all here because we don't have a deacon, but if there was a deacon here, he would be saying all those petitions. Let us ask the Lord to have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And, um, and it's the same thing with beggars. They're asking you for alms. They're asking you for mercy. In today's passage, when you see this blind man that's sitting by the roadside begging, it seems that partially the people want to turn him away. It's possible. Because when he approaches Jesus and says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, what do they think he's asking for? probably money. He's asking for alms. And they're saying, go away. Stop pestering us. When you drive by to Starbucks in the neighborhood here, if you go to get coffee, or if you go over to the, the Walmart that's over there, um, um, Gail Gardner, You'll notice every time that you leave that there's almost always somebody sitting at the corner begging. Almost always, almost every day. So I want you to think about who this poor blind man is and how we often, too, would drive someone like that away. Today, we commemorate a great saint of the church, and I'll talk about her in a moment, Blessed Xenia of St. Petersburg, who also, for most of her life, had the appearance and was treated with the same disdain as a beggar. We call her in the tradition of the church, she's called a fool for Christ's sake. She's someone that embraced this radical, absolute foolishness before the entire world, was completely despised by everyone for the sake of the gospel. This passage this morning in talking about the blind man who was a beggar, it follows closely on the heels 
of another happening encounter in the Gospel of Luke. You remember the rich young man who comes to the Lord and says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And of course, the rich ruler has obeyed all of these from his youth. But then Jesus says, you still lack one thing. Sell all you have, distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard these things, he became very distressed because he was very rich. And this is when Jesus says how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom of God. That he uses this analogy that makes it seem impossible for them to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for someone who is wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God. Those who heard it exclaimed, then who can be saved? Who? It seems that in the Gospel of Luke, the answer is given that the one who has become like a beggar can be saved. The one who cries out to the Lord for mercy day and night can be saved. What's impossible with men is become possible with God. Just as the impossibility of the blind man being able to see again is made possible with God through faith. Furthermore, there's another answer that's given. Because right after the blind man is healed, as Jesus finally enters into Jericho, he encounters Zacchaeus. And what is Zacchaeus? He's a rich man. Not only is he a rich man, but he's a rich man through extortion and abuse of others. And what does Jesus say after Zacchaeus promises to give half of his goods to the poor and to restore fourfold everything that he had taken from other people? He says, today salvation has come to this house. So what was impossible with men is possible with God. But we have to have this attitude and this way of being that certainly Zacchaeus himself manifests and that the blind man manifests, that he has become a beggar before the Lord God that cries out to him ceaselessly day and night for mercy, and that he's willing to give up everything that he has for the sake of following after Christ. And even, and this is why I want to focus now on the life of Saint Zenia, She's a fool for Christ, but she's also a fool out of love for her husband, who is a terrible sinner. When Xenia and her husband were married, the couple lived in St. Petersburg, but she became a widow at 26 when her, sudden, when her husband died suddenly at a party from drinking. So he died from over drinking. She grieved for the loss of her husband, and especially because he died without confession or Holy Communion. Once her earthly happiness ended, she did not look for it again. And I'm reading to you from her life. You can find it on the, um, the Lives of Saints on the website of the Orthodox Church in America. Once her earthly happiness ended, she did not look for it again. From that time forward, Xenia lost interest in the things of this world and followed the difficult path of foolishness for the sake of Christ. The basis for this strange way of life is to be found in the first epistle to the Corinthians, where St. Paul talks about how the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world but it's wiser than the wisdom of men. The Lord strengthened her 
and helped her to bear sorrow and misfortune patiently for the next 45 years. She started wearing her husband's clothing and insisted that she be addressed as Andrew Feodorovich, which was her husband's name. She told people that it was she and not her husband who had died. In a certain sense, this was perfectly true. She abandoned her former way of life and experienced a spiritual rebirth. When she gave away her house and possessions to the poor, her relatives complained to the authorities. So you can imagine when things like this happen, you can imagine, you know, St. Anthony, when he sells everything and gives it away, there may have been, you know, I don't think St. Anthony had anybody, but if you imagine if there was family members, how upset they would be. <laughs> what are you doing with our inheritance? What are you doing with the money that's coming to us? You're just throwing it all away. Her relatives complained to the authorities, but after speaking to Xenia, the officials were convinced that she was in her right mind and was entitled to dispose of her property as she saw fit. Soon she had nothing left for herself, so she wandered through the poor section of Petersburg with no place to lay her head. She refused all assistance from her relatives, happy to be free of worldly attachments. When her late husband's red and green uniform wore out, she clothed herself in rags of those colors. After a while, Xenia left Petersburg for eight years. It is believed she visited holy elders and ascetics throughout Russia, seeking instruction in the spiritual life. She may have visited St. Theodore of Sanaxar, who had been a military man himself. And this is the fascinating thing. Theodore's life was one that dramatically changed when a young officer died at a drinking party. It may have been Xenia's husband. Perhaps this officer was St. Xenia's husband. In any case, Xenia knew St. Theodore and profited from his instructions. She eventually returned to the poor section of Petersburg where she was mocked and insulted because of her strange behavior. When she did accept money from people, it was only small amounts which she used to help the poor. She spent her nights praying without sleep in a field outside the city. Prayer strengthened her and in her heart's conversation with the Lord, she found the support she needed on her difficult path. When a new church was being built in the Smolensk Cemetery, St. Xenia brought bricks to the site. She did this in secret during the night so that no one would know. Soon her great virtue and spiritual gifts began to be noticed. She prophesied future events affecting the citizens of Petersburg and even the royal family. Against her will, she became known as someone pleasing to God, and nearly everyone loved her. They said, Xenia does not belong to this world. She belongs to God. People regarded her visits to their homes or shops as a great blessing. Xenia loved children, and mothers rejoiced when the childless widow would stand and pray over a baby's crib or kiss a child. They believed that the Blessed One's kiss would bring that child good fortune. St. Xenia lived about 45 years after the death of her husband and departed to the Lord at the age of 71. The exact date and circumstances of her death are not known, but it probably took place at the end of the 18th century. She was buried in the Smolensk Cemetery. By the 1820s, People flocked to her grave to pray for her soul and to ask her to intercede with God for them. So many visitors took earth from her grave that it had to be replaced every year. Later, a chapel was built over her grave. Those who turned to St. Xenia in prayer received healing from illness and deliverance from their afflictions. She is also known for helping people who seek jobs, which is a good thing to know. If you're looking for employment, to ask her to intercede. But you see how 
Senya became a fool for Christ, but also out of love for her husband, out of love for another. These two things going together, fulfilling the commandments of the Lord to love your God, Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. May we learn to become like her in our devotion to the Lord and in our love for one another. May we learn to become like the blind man and cry out to the Lord day and night with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength for his healing and deliverance. And may we learn to become like Zacchaeus and give of everything that we have, surrendering all that belongs to us, recognizing that it all belongs to God, even unto our very life, our soul, our body, our mind, and our strength. Amen. Amen.